As we continue our conversation on the supply of labor, we're now going to look at the labor-leisure trade-off relationship, and this has to do with the opportunity cost of leisure being an hour of labor and knowing that we receive uh, for that hour of labor some kind of a wage. In doing this, we'll take a look at this labor-leisure trade-off. We'll consider the effect in a model for labor-leisure labor, leisure trade-off. Uh, we'll take a look at this effect of income and wages. We'll look at effects of overtime or premium pay. And we'll take a look at wealth or endowment effects. So first, let's consider this labor-leisure trade-off model. This is a model that will be fairly simple to understand, but just, you'll need to pay brief attention to what's happening on the x-axis and make sure that you understand that. So this is a basic uh, xy coordinate, but now it's not labor supply and labor demand. We're not looking at wage and quantity specifically here, although we are looking at some wage or income on the y-axis, so it's measured in dollar values. And we are looking now at some hours, but here we look at leisure as we go from 0 to 16 hours which would be the same thing as looking at labor going at from 16 to zero hours. So if we are increasing our leisure hours, we're decreasing our labor hours. So this is a little bit different than we've seen in our basic labor supply or labor demand uh, environment. So if we think about this, let's assume that one has a wage of $20 an hour. And we know that we can come up here and we can draw a line coming from our 16 hours of available leisure a day which is also 16 hours of available labor and we know that if we spend zero hours in leisure then we must be spending 16 hours in labor at which point our intersection here, our transection of the y-axis, is going to be that 16 times 20, which I believe is $320. Well, a couple of things to think about here is that the slope of this line has a relationship with the wage. In fact, actually, it's the negative of the wage. The wage is 20, so we know this is downward sloping, so this is going to be negative 20, which simply is our rise over run. And in this case, rise is change in income, and run is change in hours. Well, it doesn't matter if it's a change in labor hours or a change in leisure hours. It's the exact same change. So we don't have to concern ourselves with this. And if you think about it, we can just generalize this because we know that here is we had a change in income from 0 to 320. So a change in income of 320. We had a change in hours of 16, which is... 20. So in this case, we know that the slope of this labor-leisure trade-off line is negative of the wage. So we can think about uh, many of our labor-leisure decisions within this kind of a model. Well, let's look at some of the possible effects on this model of different changes. So here I've replicated the model for us, and let's assume for a moment that one is working eight hours a day at the $20 an hour that we've suggested. And, uh, and and that's that's taking them to some daily budget that they have either elected or they've been subjected to of $160 a day having worked eight hours a day. Well, what happens in this line if wages go from 20 to 22? Well, if wages go from 20 to 22, at 22 times 16, I'm going to have $352 of possible income as I spend 16 hours of labor. So 22 times 16 is 352. But I still have a situation where if I'm using all of my 16 hours at leisure, I'm at zero wage, which simply means that my labor-leisure line has shifted 
as, as this. And the new slope of this line is the new wage, of course. So this is what we see when we have a positive change in income. Similarly, a negative change in income would give us the same effect, only it would be downwards as follows. So income or wage rise, we then see that the line shifts outward. Wage falls, we see that the line shifted inwards. Well, what's the effect of overtime in this? Well, this, this might be a little bit interesting to us if we think about overtime. So when we think about overtime, we're typically thinking about time and a half. So if we have, let's say, $20 an hour for the first eight hours, and if we think about that at time and a half, that would then be $30 an hour for hours 8 through 16 of labor. So this is labor that we're talking about, of course, since we're talking about working, in which case I then have... I then have uh, the $160 for the first eight hours of labor. But then the next eight hours of labor, I'm going to see the line actually trend more steeply. And it's going to take me to a $400 total, which is that $30. So the slope here is 20. The slope here is 30. And I have 8 times 20. plus 8 times 30 is going to equal 160 plus 240, which will equal 400. So that's how I've identified this point here. It's fairly simple for you conceptually to think about this. When we see this relationship of overtime, let's say overtime kicked in at 8 hours a day, or we might think about this at 40 hours a week, but since we're looking at the daily uh, charting here or graphing here, we're going to think about this on a daily basis. We see that this change kinking northward, we call this an overtime kink. An overtime kink. So it has kinked or changed the slope of this labor leisure trade off. Well, that's interesting and that makes good sense to us, but it's just something to think about when we're kind of observing changes in the labor leisure trade off, which really tells us that for the first eight hours of le or first eight hours of labor, we simply have this 20 to 1 trade off. The next eight hours of labor, we have a 30 to 1 trade off. So it changed by time and a half which also suggests to us something about the opportunity cost of our leisure time here. Let's think about the effect on this model if we have some changes in endowments. So let's assume for a moment that uh, an individual receives an inheritance. That's going to be equal to $50 a day or $50 for every working day. Well, we're thinking of working day as uh, five days a week, of course. So this would be $250 a, a week and times 52 weeks of the year. So this would have perhaps equaled as much as $13,000 a year. So if a worker received an endowment, an inheritance that would give them $13,000 a year, a year of income, how do we see changes in this model? Well, we have to think about what's happening here at 50. At 50, in this case, this worker does not need to work at all. In fact, this worker can get $50 in a day and still have 16 hours of leisure because of this uh, endowment. But now we know that that 50 on top of the potential wage income from labor the person would have would take us to 370 and we then have, oh my goodness, we then have a labor leisure trade-off line that's changed as, as such. So we see that when we have an endowment the, uh, for a daily amount, as we've identified it here, that it's literally going to give us a line that goes straight up from the 16 hours of leisure, or zero hours of labor, comes straight up vertical from that to the $50 point, 
and then has a slope equal to the wage. So our slope here on both of these two lines was 20, but they're separated by the $50 wage. So this is a discussion of the labor-leisure trade-off relationship.